Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. In case you missed it earlier, you can access the conference kit via the QR code on the screen behind me. Earlier, you heard about the key trends and developments in digital inclusion. This panel will now look at practical examples of how the three Ps, the public, private, and people sectors, as well as academia, foster digital inclusion. There are three speakers for this panel, and each speaker has 15 minutes, after which we will have a Q&A session. The first speaker is Dr. Kwak Dong Kyun. Dr. Kwak is a media policy expert who has worked on many media issues such as pay TV competition, OTT videos, and vitalizing the video content industry. He believes that with proper public policies, digitalization is beneficial for everyone. Dr. Kwak, please. Hello, everyone. As introduced, I am Dong Kyun Kwak from Korea. I am a research fellow at KISD. The My Institute is a government-funded public policy institute, and its primary mission is to help for Korean government to make a good public decision in terms of ICT policies. And I feel very honored to be here with you and in, in this meaningful global event, and please to have these precious opportunities to share Koreans' digitalization experience with you. And especially, I appreciate everyone who is involved in organizing this symposium. Today, my pre presentations briefly introduce Koreans' successful digitalization experience to you, Singaporeans, and who are also showing an awesome achievement in, the field, in this field. Here we go. My presentation consists of these four parts. Obviously, we have lots of talking points, but the time constraints make me hurry, and my presentation seems to be a little bit too general without specific points. My presentation may sound, at least to some of you, it's off the target, but please be patient until the conclusion. Let me start from the overview. As you see, Korea has very populated, highly populated dense, uh, population density countries like you. And Korea has been the uh, number one country for 13 continuous quarters in terms of average internet speed. And some of you, are, some of these factors sound familiar to you, and some may not. Here is the current status. Even Korea is no longer the world's best internet country currently, but Korea is still in good shape, like this. So yeah, we are very good, in good shape in government, like you. And also OECD ranked Korea's world War first open news reusable, reusable government index, like this. And ITU also uh, put Korea as world number two in ICT development index, like this. But in terms of digital inclusion, However, Korea is not a top rank at all, frankly speaking. Most Koreans are also very proud of their entertainment and cultural achievement like this. I guess at least some of you enjoyed these Korean dramas and K-pops already. And the BTS uh, became the first Korean winner of a U.S. Billboard Music Award last year. Let me focus on the Korean government's efforts toward information society.
As you see, Korean government has to make up a master plan for national informatization in every five years by law. The Korean journey toward building on advanced information societies began since in 1994. Establishing legal system and constructing nationally broadband network infrastructures was a primary goal in that period. Since 2003, the social implementation promotion began. It means every field, including government itself, was encouraged to be digitalized. Since 2008, the Korea began to connect every digitalized field and its digital resource. After 2013, convergence has been a dominant agenda. Currently, the intelligent implementation began. Some experts prefer to use the digital transformation in this stage. This is uh, the newest version of Korea Mass Plan. The, under the vision, the Korea to live well together with the intelligence, we have these kind of the four policy goals. Building smart countries and economic rebounding, utilizing ICT technologies, and constructing a digitalized trustworthy society and advancing toward intelligent infrastructure are these goals. You can see the meaning of these goals in the next slide. The, some of these national digital transition with intelligence and finding growth engines with digital innovation and creating people-centered intelligent information society, which is closely related to digital inclusion itself and establishing a foundation for the trust-based intelligence. So the detailed plans you can find here. If you are interested in a more detailed explanation, please feel free to contact me later. But I believe that some of these plans don't look strange to you. That is very familiar to you, I believe that. And as a third policy thrust, we have three, this, and we are familiar realizing digital inclusions are included as one of the, our action plans. So let's talk about digital inclusion in Korea. As you see, the reducing or minimizing discrimination is essential, as you see in, the, in this action plan. But, and the second one, the vulnerable class. Vulnerable class should have a special attention to be kept with intelligent information skill. And they are entitled and encouraged to participate in economic and social activities in digital way, like all of us. So here is some brief comparisons between Korea and your countries. As you see in this slide, digital inclusion looks very similar in both countries. But as you saw the previous slide, digital inclusion itself is not the top priority agenda in Korea. In your countries, it seems to me that the digital inclusion itself is a core agenda of a digital readiness plan. I am still wondering what makes this delicate difference between these two countries. Obviously, the digital inclusion is one of the Korean government's goal. 
for intelligent informatization, but doesn't look as a top tier goal to my government. And I think this kind of, uh, I, don't, I don't want to hide this reality or don't want to say that my government to be uh, high, to indifferent to the digital inclusion itself. But my government is not highly interested in digital inclusion itself. It's a reality and it's a fact. But as you see, it ranks as a third priority agenda. In Singapore, you pay a very comprehensive and careful attention to digital inclusion. To me, it looks to me. So why we have this kind of difference? I'm not sure, but I want to say that the motivation of national digital transition of informatization in Korea came from the Koreans' very strong desire towards a digitalized industry. In other words, Koreans have a strong belief that digitalization or advancing advanced level of digital society itself can provide the people with a more prosperous future. All the other problems can be overcome thanks to digital technologies. That's Korean's strong belief, a quite optimistic one, I think. In your case, I don't see an industry first approach, actually. I don't know which country would have a better approach, but hopefully we are in the same direction in the long run. It's a conclusion. As I mentioned, here is a short conclusion of my presentation. As you see, Korea has been one of the fastest countries in digital development since in the middle or late of 1990s. During that time, Korean national motto was that we should go ahead toward informatization, although we were late in industrialization. Our, one of our former presidents, the President Kim Dae-jung, made up of this motto under his administration. So information society itself was one of the top priority national agenda in Korea. Comprehensive master planning was set up repeatedly in every five years. ICT industry, as you know, became one of the most important sectors in Korea. Huge national resource has been invested in this area. Since 2017, digital transformations have replaced digital transition or informatization concept in Korea. Koreans are most, mostly, Kore, most Koreans are optimistic with this one, this move. Of course, Korea has new challenges like this. I, don't, I think your country is on the similar situation too. Fake news was a hot topic last year in Korea. The vulnerable class is more vulnerable to this fake news, as you know. Someone believed that digital literacy could be a good remedy for this problem, but others prefer legal enforcement to this indirect, uh, prefer legal enforcement to this indirect solution. Debate is still going on in Korea. Unemployment, digital un unemployment, is also a problem. Unemployment causes serious headaches to top decision makers in Korea. AI and machine would replace human labor. Someone says, the vulnerable class is likely to be exposed to this threat more often than the, the other class, as you know. Of course, I hope we can go differently. I, I wonder, you opinion about this. And borderless digital economy is also a problem. 
Yes, the decent inclusion is a matter of budget in most cases. We have to make money to promote your digital inclusion policy. But digital economy makes this, problem, this task is more difficult to get money in your country. And you can find some digital inclusion issues here, also, here. and that's the reality. And, but as I mentioned before, I don't want to make my government ready to make our social society digitally inclusive. If I say that way, it would be uh, um, it would be a force or a, a kind of a disguisement of our reality. I don't want to disguise the Korean reality in front of you. But please don't think that I criticize my government. <laughs> in fact, I believe that my country is also in the right direction. The finally, government pro governance problems came out here so without. Which government body should have final responsibility for the, the intelligent information society? It is on issues. History shows us that a lot of tension exists among players, government players, even under the same administration. Digital inclusion is an issue here, Korea. Ministry of Health and the Social Welfare, as well as Ministry of Science and ICT, of, or the Case Korean Communication Commission is interested in this bill, but Koreans who need some help to be included in this digital world may be frustrated when they find the right government body to seek help. How about your case? This is my short presentation. If, if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me with this email address. I will try to my best to answer the best, to provide you the best answer. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kwok. The next speaker is Mr. Lian Chung Yuan. He is the Singapore head for Gojek, an Indonesian ride-hailing service that has since grown into a super app. In his spare time, he goes on challenging vacations and has submitted Mount Everest NK2. Let's welcome Mr. Lian. Thanks. So, uh, first question, has anyone not heard of Gojek? I've heard of you, so good. I will come and personally, I'll come and personally help you later. Um, second, do we have any Indonesians in the audience? So, okay. Two Indonesians. Anyone that frequently goes to Indonesia? Okay, a few. So, <coughs> first point is uh, for all of you out there who haven't downloaded the Gojek app and who haven't used the Gojek app yet, please go and do so as part of the price of admission into this. And if you don't know how to, as part of digital inclusion, I will personally help you. I have a team here that will help you later. Um, well, the symposium today is about digital inclusion, so I thought I'd start with uh, two stories. Story one is I was driving a I was driving for a competitor one of these days. He was a very he was an elderly lady. She only spoke in Mandarin. And when I pulled up, there were two taxis and myself, you know, in a private ride-hailing vehicle. Obviously, I beat the taxis and I got the ride. And uh, I was asking her, how come there's so many vehicles here? She says, Oh, uh, I I don't know how to cancel the the rides. So I was like, okay, that, that's fine. And so I, I drove her and we had a very pleasant conversation. Um, of course, at the end of it, she paid in cash, which was nice. She gave me a tip. So wasn't using, she didn't use the app. The app had, she had, the, the, the vehicle was um, hailed for her by her helper. And uh, she didn't have, she had cards, but she hadn't linked her credit cards or her digital payment methods to the, to the, um, to the app. And so, of course, at the end of it, I said, uh, Auntie, you know, I'll help you to download this Gojek app. They're very good. And since, uh, which means, you know, uh, let me help you. And since I was such a polite young man throughout it, she says, okay, I'll give this Gojek uh, a try. So that's one example of uh, sort of digital exclusion. And this might be one where I look at somebody and say, okay, you know, I laugh at them. But then the flip side of that is when I joined, when I joined Gojek. So anyone here, um, 
Anyone here uses Microsoft or uses Microsoft Office? Who uses Microsoft Office uses the cloud? Okay, good. Now, who here uses um, Google or Google Docs, Google Sheets? Okay. Um, what is your primary one? So, hands up if Microsoft Suite is your primary. And uh, now, hands up if uh, Google Docs is, Google is your primary. Okay, that's actually quite a good split, kind of 50-50. So when I joined my company, um, I, was a, I used to be a management consultant, PowerPoint Ranger, really good at those. And then it became really difficult for me because now everyone uses uh, Google Docs and it's, uh, it's on the cloud. And I had to relearn a whole new, whole new, um, whole new language. So first question for me was, so, and this is where my younger colleagues would laugh at me. And so question posed to the crowd is, well, they're all, given that um, digital technology is very consumer facing, will there always be a digital gap that comes with age because technology is always changing? We put on our, nobody on their CV now puts, I read and I write. Everyone, right, nobody does. But some people used to put, I, I, I know Microsoft Office. Nowadays, I see CVs that say, I know SQL, I know Tableau, I know Ruby, I know Python. So will there always be this lack of digital inclusion? And that's sort of relevant in a Singapore context because we are already a very digitally uh, sort of advanced society, right? So that's sort of by way of a preamble. Um, I thought I'd also like to talk a little bit about this, which is access literacy and participation. Um, one of the previous speakers talked about useful usage. And I thought, well, you know, games, are, games and entertainment are really useful usage. Uh, because if, you, if you're doing something that's boring, you really, really like having the digital entertainment out there. So if you're sitting, if you're a security guard, sort of, maybe you should be playing games, but games once in a while sort of keep you entertained and occupied. So if this whole spirit of digital inclusion, if there is no real problem to solve, if it's something that's driven by the government, then it is very much of a push, not a pull. Grandparents that learn how to use their iPads because they want to speak to their grandchildren, that is a great use case. That is a pull. Then I don't need to go and force them to learn how to use it because it is a problem they're trying to solve. And maybe that sort of will, that'll be the theme that I run through the rest of my presentation. If you think of Gojek and many of the social problems that we were trying to solve in Indonesia or in some of the other countries around Southeast Asia, that is a pull. There is a real problem and there's a real solution that people are then you know, really excited to do so. Second problem that I like to pose is, how do you scale? We are in more than 150 cities in Southeast Asia. We know that the best, in Indonesia alone, we know that the best way to scale is digitally. But if the problem is that people are not digitally sort of super savvy, how do you use digital methods to scale? You can't, right? So that's kind of like pulling yourself up by the bootstraps. So there's always going to be an offline method to it. There's always going to be different channels, different components. We all learn in school, so that's a hierarchical network. You have peer networks, whether it is the silver, the elderly, teaching the elderly, you will have key opinion leaders. And so we've got some stories about how we managed to acquire through offline networks in order to get people onto the digital network. So how did Gojek start? We, there was a real problem. Existing solutions always exist, uh, which is we have OJEX. OJEX are motorcycle taxis in Indonesia. And this was a very informal barter, not barter, but you, it's an informal system. You go to the roadside, there's a bunch of OJEX there, and you talk to them and you say, okay, uh, let me arrange a price with you, let me go somewhere. And the question was, how did we get the OJEX into this sort of platform marketplace where we, where we could uh, organize them in a much better way? And um, original system was really manual. We had, a, we had three phone lines, we had an Excel spreadsheet where people calling up saying, uh, uh, I want to go from A to B. And then we will call, we will take the A to B, we will call the, the ring leader or the key leader within the group and say, I have a dispatch from A to B. Do any of your drivers want it? And then he would look around, he would ask his guys offline and then, and then he would call us back or, and then we would call back the, we would call back the, um, the, the customer and then this whole round trip process took 20 minutes. We could maybe do one or two, 10, it took maybe 10 minutes, sorry, to do one transaction. We had three landlines. So in a typical day, that took, you know, maybe do 100 plus rides. That's how we began before we moved to mobile in 2015 and then where we are now. 
And the first question is, if you want to drive digital inclusion as an organization or as the government, first you have to have your, you, you must be digital. And so the first point about being, about driving that was we had to be digital, we had to go from Excel to a big spreadsheet to a huge allocation engine that can now do millions of allocations a day. Imagine trying to do that manually, right? You, that just doesn't scale. And then of course we went mobile and that allows us to access a lot more. Uh, so what does Gojek look like now? We all, everyone thinks Gojek is just, in Singapore we are one icon, but if you ever go to Indonesia, you will see, you know, there are more than 29 icons that we offer. So a very quick example of the value proposition. In the morning, we send you to work. At lunchtime, we send you your meals. In the afternoon, we send you your laundry. We will send you your parcels. In the evening, we take you home. And if you're tired, or you need your hair done, or you need your nails done, we will send you a Go Glam, we'll send you a hairdresser, and then that will go straight to your house. And as an example, I don't know if any of, well, there are some quite glamorous, I won't call out names of friends who look very glamorous here, but they're very glamorous people. And there was a DBS private banker who said, you know, uh, she had to go to the airport, she was late. So she called two Gojeks, one for herself, one for her luggage, and she made it there on time. During that trip, she had a big event to go to. Her hair was a mess. Of course, she's a very glamorous lady. So she said, I can't go off my hair like this. She called in a hairdresser who did her hair for her. And it's perfect. So the benefits to the consumer is tremendous. If we think of the minutes saved, we think of the convenience, if we think of access to opportunities. So one big impact is on the consumer side. Now we've taken the model around Southeast Asia, maybe for, for the crowd here, uh, really also to understand that Southeast Asia isn't, isn't the same. I think a lot of Singaporeans have a view of we build here and then we d deploy and distribute in Southeast Asia with a sense of Southeast Asia maybe uh, being a little bit less, a little bit more backward. So possibly, possibly true in terms of some of the metrics, but I'd say let's approach that with respect and with a lot more context. Uh, motorcycle taxis, we do motorcycle taxis in Thailand, in Vietnam, in Indonesia. They are very different in all of these places, which we can talk about later. Um, so these are some of the pain points. So at first I talked about digital inclusion is part of why do we want digital inclusion? Digital inclusion is maybe sort of a subset of te technological inclusion. And technological inclusion is a subset of broader social inclusion. And why do we want inclusion? Inclusion is really about access to opportunities, whether it's earning opportunities or uh, education opportunities or information opportunities, right? Inclusion means access to opportunities. Your start point then really is what differentiates between um, Singapore what, what does it mean to be digitally included in Singapore? Does that mean that you know how to code and you know, use a JavaScript? Whereas in other places, it might be the access, uh, access question that we talked about. Um, so right now, there are three sort of, there, there may be three levels of, three levels of uh, the Gojek platform. Version one was moving people to places and moving things to people. That's version one. Version two was then wrapping that around payments. Most large parts of Indonesia is unbanked. The instant you're unbanked, which most people here can't understand, right? Unbanked means no wallet. Unbanked means no saving history. Unbanked means I can't put money in, 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 in and sort of use that for, for later. Uh, so second version was actually V2 or the second layer was really to wrap around wallets, which then can give you savings, which can give you loans, payments, credit, and all other financial services. Then level three is movement of um, digital services, which could be consumption of entertainment, tickets, media, so on and so forth. But this is our ecosystem, right? So uh, this is the benefit to the consumer, all the different things that we can do now. Um, we didn't really think about trying, uh, well, there's a lot of consumer acquisition in terms of um, getting them onto the platform. But once you're in the platform and you see access to all of these other services seamlessly, if I take a Gojek ride and I want Gojek food, you know, I mean, that is all within one ecosystem. And that actually, that, that facilitation, that ease, is really what, that is the work that sort of uh, customer-facing companies need to deal with. And for maybe private sector, public sector folk trying to think about digital inclusion, what is that ease and what is that use case that you're trying to solve? So this is sort of around the, around the clock, all the different services that one can consume on the Gojek platform and the impact that was driven as a result of that. 
digital services subsequently, whether it is news, entertainment, insurance, games, uh, medicine, telemedicine, e-commerce, all of that is available. Um, so we talked about the three parts. We've got the consumers, the users, we've got our drivers, and then we've got our merchants. I talked a little bit about the users. Maybe move to the um, drivers. This is the driver ecosystem. The driver ecosystem is, this is what you'll see, they get orders. We allow then with the payments um, stack or payments layer, it allows them to actually save, save for the hatch, um, get loans, get financing, and then access new merchants. So here I'll tell a story, two stories. One is, when our drivers were delivering food, uh, it, was, it, was, it was difficult because there were some, first, smartphones were not a thing, so we actually provided the tools. We gave them Android, cheap Android smartphones so that they could actually use it, right? So that's, that's one. Second, we obviously held big classes, so there's a big offline component to recruiting them, giving them phones, teaching them how to use it. Had to teach them to get over the fear of being in an, escalator, uh, in an elevator. Imagine if you never used an elevator, you step in a confined, confined room, confined space, it's, that can be a little bit wor worrying. Um, in some of our smaller cities, we actually have, uh, one of my colleagues had to go there and win over the local driver union. And in order to win over the union, if anyone has been, you know, I, I've done some training with the Indonesian Special Forces, they are a very gung-ho, macho gang. And so my friend, this colleague of mine, had to go there where there were, he had to take a big python, wrap it around himself, it was in the rain, there was, uh, ritual with knife and you no, know, but I mean it shows respect. So I think in all this, if you demonstrate the respect, then you can. It, it's a it's a trite point, but it is important that let's not nag, right? Let's not nag and let's not push. If there is a real pull factor, if there's a real need, and if there's respect, it's quite easy to win people over. And so because there's a real need, I think that the number is that we have millions of transactions. So more than a million. Uh, riders are, drivers are actually employed on the, or use the Gojek platform and earn on the Gojek platform and their average earnings is now 30-40% in excess of the minimum wage and with all these amazing stories of how it has transformed their life. So this is for the, this is for the, for the drivers. I've got some nice videos about that but you know we can show that later. So we see this, uh, one and a half times the minimum wage, they can now save and and then after that, they can think about what they can think about the future, right? So it has provided them the inclusion has afforded them earning opportunities, which then allow them to save, earn, and sort of think about the longer term. Then we have the merchants. Many of our merchants are actually small SMEs. Uh, these are your mom and pop shops who will do cooking. Um, and there's a story of a merchant who said, "I don't know who these guys in green are," meaning Gojek. This is Gojek Green but uh, they have allowed me to send my son back to school after four years out of school. So again, um, I think my numbers should be here somewhere. Uh, well, so we, once the, the instant you're on Gojek platform, we're talking about 3x. Once you have access to digital distribution, it's a 3x growth in their revenues. Um, and with, once you're on the platform, then there's analytics, there's marketing, we can help them do their SKU management. It's, it's really amazing. So, so this is the benefits that have been uh, provided on the merchant side. Uh, so these are the different aspects from the payments, the point of sale, inventory management, and then obviously linking to a larger ecosystem, which then starts to cycle. The more users are on the system, the more they transact, the more the merchants will come on and then it takes on a flywheel effect of its own. Uh, maybe just close with a few stories about Gojek and Gojek Singapore. There is huge social impact. We've got many stories of drivers. Obviously, the question everyone asks is, okay, that's a nice story in Indonesia. What is the relevance here? What's the relevance here in Singapore? Our level of digital literacy is much, much higher. But it, which is not to say that we are, everyone is at the same level. Ride hailing offers choice. Um, we have many drivers who now have an opportunity to say, I, I don't want to drive 12 hours a day like a full-time taxi driver, but I do want to have the chance to spend time with my family. So that is what ride hailing offers here. Um, we have uh, <coughs> done more than 10 million rides in Singapore in the first six months. So really proud of that. If you think of um, the back-end benefits, which we do, a lot of these are digitally mediated. One of the things we realized is that for a ride-hailing operator, even if you're much older, 
the mindset of saying, I take my jobs from an app. I do telemedicine consult, so I don't need to see a doctor. Uh, I don't need to wait two hours in a waiting room, but I can get my medicine delivered to me. The fact that a lot of their uh, earnings are actually on a screen and there's no need for physical cash, that is a real mindset shift as comp compared to some of the older generation of riders who may, uh, drivers who may say, I want to pick up passengers by the roadside, I don't really trust an app. So even here, we have managed to sort of win over drivers. Um, a little bit is self-selected, a little bit is education. And uh, so this is the presence that we have here. And even at the very high end, there's a data science team that helps make um, these decisions and these choices much easier for the, for the marketplace. So uh, that's sort of the overall Gojek story and what we are doing in Singapore and how we are helping drive digital inclusion which leads to overall social inclusion and earning opportunities. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lian. Our final speaker for this panel is, Ms. is Professor Yuta Treveranus. Prof. Treveranus is a director of the Inclusive Design Research Center she is also a prof at OCAD University in Toronto, where she founded a graduate program in inclusive design. Thank you. And um, I want to say, first off, I'm a senior citizen, so I think I have a longer view of digital inclusion and this digital revolution. And uh, I try, uh, if, um, they say that with age comes wisdom, and I think that comes more from having made many mistakes. So I'm going to give you some of the wisdom from the many mistakes that I've made. Um, my talk is about inclusive design and the design by inc or inclusion by design component of the framework that we heard about. And first of all, I want to thank you for inviting me to Singapore and wishing you a, a happy birthday. Um, I'm unfortunately not here for your birthday, but I'm here for parts of the original celebrations. And I understand that in Singapore, um, there is an aspiration to lead the fourth industrial revolution. And of course, um, the words that are frequently used are the aspirations and values of the fourth industrial revolution is transformation, innovation, disruption, and smart nation. Um, so you have the aspiration of becoming not just a smart city or a smart community, but a smart nation. And one of the things that strikes me and a piece of advice I'd like to give is I, I think you also are an ideal nation to take a much more transformative, innovative, disruptive, and smart approach to this because I believe that many of the other countries that have similar aspirations are still under the influence of men from the 1800s. And I'll tell you why I'm saying this. Um, the first man I think that uh, everyone is still under the influence of, and that includes uh, many of our ranking systems, is an individual called Ketele, and he invented the average man. Um, during the first uh, big data movement, which was back in the 1800s. He was obsessed with standardization, with valorizing conformity and demonizing deviation. The next um, old man that um, everyone is under the influence of, and I believe you are as well, was Pareto. And he came up with the 80-20 principle and this notion that if you want quick wins, if you want um, to get rich quick, then just ignore the difficult 20% that take up 80% of the effort and focus on the 80% that take up 20% of the effort. The other um, older white man that everyone is under the influence of still is not necessarily Darwin, but our interpretation of Darwinism. Where, where uh, what we've taken from Darwin is this idea of survival of the fittest. Life is a winner takes all zero sum game. Um, we want to beat uh, Sweden or <laughs> whatever, and only the, the fit will survive. Of course, um, that wasn't really Darwin's message, but um, I'll say more about that. 
And the last uh, person, and of course there probably are many more, during that first big data revolution was Dewey. And this is not De um, John Dewey, but Melville Dewey. And he was very much about efficiency, order, and control. He came up with the Dewey Decimal System, which you use in your libraries. So his idea was that everything needed to be sorted, categorized, and labeled. And of course, many of the ways that people were labeled or categorized was somewhat biased. And he was so uh, enamored of efficiency that he actually changed his last name to DUI. Um, because he felt that the spelling was inefficient. So we have all of these ideas, and I would challenge you to think about what, how you have internalized these ideas, because I'm sure that you've said normal, average, best, highest ranking, um, that you have labeled and categorized quite a bit in your everyday life. And these ideas are assumed and entrenched. They're fundamental principles that we live by. They're inextricably enmeshed in our worldview. Um, it forms our notions of truth and value, which is quite uh, tragic. And it shapes education, business, markets, design, and public policy. So if we want to do something that is quite transformational, that escapes those 18th century ideas, I think we need to reconsider each of these. In terms of Darwinism, it, what we've discovered is that uh, when humans advanced, when humans formed language, when we formed any of the really um, uh, forward thinking, new, abilities, it was actually when there was a relaxation of natural selection, because that's when we had genetic choice. And that led to the human advances. Predators are less adaptive. Um, it is, in fact, the case that when we allow diversity to happen, that we form new abilities and we advance. When we think about Ketele, there is quite a bit of research and writing about uh, the fact that there is actually no average man. There's no average you. Um, so don't go to typing yourself, your color, your, your um, star sign, etc., because you change whatever context you are, whatever goal you are um, trying to achieve, and whatever social structure you are. We're all very unique and we're all very variable. Diversity, in fact, is an asset and monocultures won't survive. Um, I would encourage you to read the work of, of Scott Page, who talks about the diversity bonus. Um, when we have diversity, not when we have monocultures, are we able to uh, be more resilient and move forward? And then, in terms of Dewey, it's become quite clear that we don't need to, and in fact, the digital systems allow us to escape from the need to put people into boxes or types. We have tagging, we have ways of recognizing that people are variable, they're not flat, they have many different capabilities, and all people are generative, complex, adaptive systems. But most importantly, I, I would encourage you to rethink Pareto. Um, we have misidentified, I would say, the modern-day vital few as the difficult 20%. What happened, or how um, Pareto came to his 80-20 rule, was he uh, noticed that 80% of the land in Italy was used uh, to, or was owned by 20% of the population. And so he told the rulers, think about the vital few the 20%, and what I would say is that the vital few in this age, if we're not thinking about greed or quick wins, are actually a different group, and I'll talk more about that. And how I came to this realization, um, what, I'm gonna tell you a quick story as well. Many of our speakers have told stories because it, it relates to smart systems, and the next, uh, stage that we are, as a smart nation, you're certainly thinking quite a bit about smart systems. And this um, comes from a consultation with our Ministry of Transport, which had its 100th anniversary and wanted to know how to deal with connected and uh, automatic vehicles. And I thought I would 
try out the learning models and I uh, tried to see how the learning models would react to something unexpected and unusual. So what I did was I fed the learning models a model of my uh, friends who move in a very unexpected way. They push their wheelchairs through the junction backwards and uh, many people that encounter them in the intersection will grab them and push them back onto the sidewalk. Um, what happened was all of the learning models that were to guide cars, tell them to stop, move, change direction, or proceed, chose to run this person over. Um, when I, um, the developers of the learning model said, come back, they're not smart enough, they haven't had enough data, they don't, haven't had data about people in wheelchairs, I came back, and what happened was they did not not run them over, they ran them over with greater confidence because they were more confident that someone in a wheelchair would proceed forward. And um, so what I learned is that smarter is not always better, but this story is more than about automated vehicles. The same pattern is, happens in all population data-based AI. If you're an outlier, if you're unusual, then you won't get a loan, you won't get credit, you won't get insurance, um, you won't be picked to have an interview in a competitive job if data-based systems are used to make automated decisions. And the, the big issue before we proceed in terms of using the power tools of AI to amplify and automate our decisions is to realize that at the moment they're unable to handle diversity and complexity. They're unprepared for the unexpected and they re replicate many of our own inadequacies. We've taken the ideas of those four old men and um, imposed them upon our machine learning systems and use them to automate and amplify them. We equate evidence with majority, repeatability, and probability, and if you're not like the average, probability is wrong. We equate impact with a single measure for a large homogenous number. We are all heterogeneous and need different measures. So what is the impact? If you look, if I take um, a survey and get all of your preferences and needs here within the audience and I plot them on a multivariate scatter plot, it will look like a starburst where there is in the center what Pareto noticed, 80% of the dots and 20% of the dots will be spread throughout the periphery. What you'll notice is that the, the dots in the center are closer together, the dots out in the periphery are further apart, so people out in the periphery are more different from each other. And what has happened with that is that almost everything is made for those 80 dots in the middle and almost nothing is made or, is, or everything is more difficult for anyone that uh, moves out from that middle or is not like the average or typical. And this happens with design, it happens with being online, it happens with our knowledge, it happens with education, with work, and even with democracy where majority rules and if you're the minority then it's less likely um, that someone will be elected who's interested in your interests. But it is also not very good for the general population because what it's resulted in is mass production, mass communication, mass marketing, and the popularity push and the popularity addiction that has resulted. And it means that we have less innovation um, because who are the real vital few? And I would argue to you is if our goal is not greed, quick wins, or gaming the system, but innovation, diverse perspectives, detecting weak signals, the difficult 20% that occupy 80% of the unexplored terrain are in fact the vital few. That's where you find the innovation. That's where you find the weak signals. And also if you design for that, that's where everyone else will have room for change because we all change, we're all variable. In our country and in the US, there's a lot of talk about the polar landing, the Apollo, uh, the Apollo landing, the moonshot. And I would suggest that you have the cap capability to, 
to actually explore the next frontier. And the next frontier is that 80% of the knowledge domain and technical domain that nobody else has explored. So how? Um, I'm supposed to give you practical advice. You can't give instructions for a moonshot in 15 minutes. But what I would say is that we have all the resources online and all of our work at the IDRC is open source, open access, open standards, and open data. And we employ something called the three dimensions of inclusive design, recognize that we're all very, very unique, and we need to make people smarter about what they need, not just machines smarter in an integrated way. We need to make sure that we co-design, that we make the process of design accessible to everyone, and we need to uh, create systems that provide benefit for all, because we are living in a complex adaptive system that is our world. And uh, we have, uh, and you can, <laughs> there are uh, links to many of our instructions for smart communities and possibly nations as well. And lastly, what I would say, because of course money is said to make the world go round, um, the question is often, isn't this more costly? But what we've discovered is that cost over time and longevity benefit from taking the view of the full 100%, considering those difficult 80% right from the beginning. It may take a little bit more time, it may take um, a little bit more effort at the beginning, but your system will have greater longevity. There will be less training, less bug fixing, you won't have to create patches and hacks, um, and your system will be much more flexible because what the intention to, is to design the system in such a way that it is adaptive and um, just as a quick cliff notes, this is my advice to you. Don't ignore the difficult 20%. They're the vital few. Don't design for the average. Design with the edge. Don't just design for your customer client base. Design with people that have difficulty with or can't use your system. They'll bring the innovation, not the complacent individuals that already know how to use the system. And don't do it as an afterthought. Do it from the start. And I would challenge you to view disability as a mismatch. Um, I understand there's only 3% uh, people in um, Singapore that are recognized as having a disability, but we view disability as a mismatch between the needs of the individual and the product, service, experience, or environment offered. And um, anyone, therefore, can fee uh, experience a disability. And I'm going to very quickly, I understand that I'm out of time, but I'll tell you just one quick thing. Um, this is, uh, ask me about my lawnmower of justice, which is my approach to the automated vehicles. And uh, the conclusion, intelligence that understands, recognizes, and serves diversity is better able to respond to the unexpected, detect risk, adapt to change, transfer to new contexts. It has greater longevity, may reduce disparity, and may lift us out of our current ruts. And in addition to being a senior, I'm also a professor, so here are, is your reading list um, <laughs> where you can get further advice. And like our other speakers, I would love to continue the conversation. Thank you, Prof. May I now welcome the chairperson for this panel, Dr. Natalie Pang, Senior Research Fellow at the IPS Social Lab. We would like to remind you that you can post your questions and comments to the panelists on Pigeon Hole. Please use the passcode on the screen. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Pang and our panelists, Dr. Kwak, Mr. Lien, and Professor Trevoranus. Um, can we have the pigeonhole slide back? Yes, yes. Um, so I'll leave you to uh, collect your questions. I want to thank all our panelists and speakers uh, who gave us three very wonderful presentations. Um, Dr. Kwek, you talked about Korean governments and their strategies towards digital inclusion, uh, particularly you know, the challenges that um, um, the, in the Korean context you are facing. Um, and uh, Mr. Lian, you talked about, uh, you know, from the private perspective, go Jack. I really like your point about push and pull and the importance of motivations and gratifications um, in doing this. And Prof Yuta, I want to thank you for challenging our fundamental um, the ways and language we think about digital inclusions and what some of these um, um, uh, 
design pr principles we can consider. So I have uh, actually, uh, oh, the questions are streaming in. Um, I think, uh, I, I guess one of the questions um, I think uh, for um, uh, Dr. Quack is that I guess because there's a lot of, uh, I think the Korean government um, have been doing this uh, for a long time, right? Um, what are some of the regulations regarding privacy, access, and ownership of digital records? Um, and uh, for um, Mr. Lian, um, I think uh, there is a kind of a question that alludes to the question of algorithms. Um, specifically, it's about, I guess, um, how prices are, are computed and, I guess, um, on that note, you know, um, to what extent do uh, you know, the drivers and the commuters actually understand this and be able to um, uh, use uh, GoJack services with the understanding? Um, and uh, for uh, Prof. Yuta, uh, you talked about how uh, we might measure differently. Um, and I, I guess one question that I have is uh, what kind of different measures uh, can we consider um, when we talk about uh, digital inclusion and um, um, say five, ten years down the road, how do we measure you know, how well we have done as a society? Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks for the questions. And yeah, it's, everything is very, very difficult question, difficult tasks to our government, the, private, the piracy or the, the protecting privacy or the protecting data itself is not simple questions. And I think you also, you, your country also has this kind of uh, trouble. Uh, for the data, from the beginning, the, pr the data, the protection of the, the personal data or the big data for the Koreans is currently is not governed by Koreans, actually. It, most of our data is stored in Google's driver, Google's, Google's server. Google knows everything, even in Korean aspects. That's the reality. I don't, I, I have to be frank, <laughs> and it's a reality, but there actually, before digitalization, or the, before the big data errors, and uh, in the middle of 2008, the Korea is one of a few countries in the world who were the domestic service pro the, the portal service providers occupies more than 70% of market share. The for example, the current neighbor, uh, the biggest is the portal site, portal service in Korea, uh, the, uh, has been the number one portal site. And the Google, on the other hand, just uh, the occupies less than 30% for a long time in Korea, but the market share of neighbor is decreasing and the market share of Google is increasing. And that's the headache to my country decision makers. And we have to, but the problem is that Korea is very open countries, like your countries. We do not rely on the regulation itself and the regulation is not the best policies in this area because internet economy, in the, in the digital economy, we cannot protect one nation from the openness. It means a kind of isolation. Korea doesn't want to be isolated digitally. So that's the dilemma. So as you, we, are, so more, we have invested all resource to protect our data, but we don't think the regulation is the good policies to protect. Instead, we have to we are, we have to make some global alliance to protect the our data and to use our data globally and in equal way across the world. And 
we are, our, country, our government is open to this kind of alliance and probably one day we will meet in the, someday we will meet in that alliance to protect our data and your data in your hand. That's my answer. Sorry. I, I wanted to add, and I really appreciate your candidness and, and bringing up this particular issue. We've also been struggling with data because, as um, you mentioned, in the vulnerable populations are more, much more um, vulnerable to data abuse, data misuse, fraudulent sales, etc. So uh, one of the things that we've been working on is an ISO standard that uh, um, applies to the binary terms of service agreement where everybody supposedly gives informed consent to the use of their data in whatever way you want. I wonder how many people here in the audience have actually read the terms before they click I agree um, to, so they can use the service. It's very rare. So one of the things that we're working on is a way for the individual to declare um, who they trust with their data, for, uh, for what purpose, under what conditions, and then for the service provider that wishes to obtain the data to declare in a transparent and auditable way what is essential data, and then it becomes a negotiation. So it isn't just, I give away all my data um, in such a way that anybody can do anything with it, but rather it is a contract for a specific part and for the purposes of the service. Oh, they, uh, I, okay, sure. <laughs> so the the um, uh, metrics was and alternative me ways of measuring. Well, um, I I wrote a blog that says if you are unique and aren't we all, uh, numbers are not our friends. Um, at the whenever we have metrics and even when we have ranking. Uh, one of the things that we found, certainly, in we've done studies of education systems with ranking in the U.S., and ranking systems tend to mean that you abandon the difficult 20% that actually uh, cause most of the innovation and the forward um, thinking, and because you're trying to uh, win and you don't want to spend your effort on the difficult 20%. It also um, means that lots of people are gaming the system, so ranking systems frequently don't work. Um, but the, the um, efforts that have been looking at alternatives include uh, small, thick data efforts. So we've talked a lot about big data. You've probably heard about big data. You may not have heard about small data, but small data is the notion of bottom-up data. So data about an individual. And the place where it first emerged was in medicine, because one of the things that's happening in medicine is if you misapply data, if you take data about that mythical average person and you apply it to somebody that's not average, then they're going to get very sick and they're going to die. And so um, medicine has had to look at alternatives, and so they are looking at ways in which to actually use data to customize a medicine to the individual and not take away the context because um, what happens often and uh, where you have issues is that um, the studies that show what medicine works best have done it in a clean lab. And does anybody here live in a clean lab? I, I doubt it. So there are so many things that will influence the impact of your measures. And so um, what we need is bottom-up data that supports diversification rather than reductionism, um, which is what we're doing. And in, in terms of measuring impact, uh, the same thing applies. And can I just add regulation as well? I mean, the, the one thing that we're looking at is, yeah, to your point of regulation being, um, I, I actually spent all night last night um, correcting something on, a, on our government website because we, we've been tackling um, a legislative framework that works better for a changing information terrain because if you uh, legislate things like exactly how you should do something um, for industry, et cetera, then uh, rules and laws are very slow to change and the digital domain changes very quickly and so often 
uh, the regulations are seen to constrain innovation and to constrain um, progress. And so what we've been working on is a, a different framework. Um, and if you look up AODA, um, we're, we are um, creating a more participatory framework where there is the encouragement to actually innovate. Uh, we call it from uh, obligation to innovation or to participation. Uh, and uh, so that if anyone is considering writing regulatory frameworks, uh, I, I have lots of advice on that. <laughs> Um, so the question is on pricing, but I think I'd love to link that back to what Professor Yuta was talking about. Two points you just made. One was around um, the TNCs. And the, the TNCs point is around transparency as well as uh, transparency and consent. The second point I think you made was really around the bottom-up data, the hyper-localization. And if we think about pricing, actually, pricing the, uh, uh, the pricing mechanism that we use now actually does try to fulfill some of these which is, um, I think, the original motivation of the questions around, I don't understand, or as a writer, I may not understand the inputs into the pricing, which, which is fair. I think in the old days, uh, those who are sort of my age or older will remember taking a taxi, and you know that there's midnight surcharge, and then after a while, in order to get a pricing mechanism that was more responsive to, uh, to the market needs and to, to the environment and the conditions, we, the taxi company started to stack on more and more surcharges. And for a driver, for a passenger who didn't know what the end price would be, then you would start to have a lot of complexity around, okay, it's, is it after midnight, is it before midnight? And it got pretty complicated after a while. And so the question on pricing and pricing transparency, I think not everyone, even nowadays, would look at what goes into the pricing component. But the good thing is that when you click, you actually have a price that you agree to. So there's transparency of the outcome. Right, that then this is where your TNCs, you agree to this price. It is an agreed upon price. You may not know, know the full inputs. You can if you want to, but you don't really worry about it. You just know that there's an output. The second point is about the fact that the prices are dynamic, that there is that hyper-localization because prices ultimately reflect the local supply and demand. The classic example, if it's raining, then there are more people that want to take a ride and then there will probably be less drivers available. So this is how the pricing adjusts. Um, some of the questions around pricing may refer to what used to happen in the old days under, you know, with uh, different companies and when the industry was young, let's just say, when the industry was young, I think some of the pricing could have been pretty extreme. We don't see that anymore. So things evolve, systems evolve, industries evolve, pricing algorithms evolve. So, but I really like the underlying point of uh, contextual clarity of um, pre-agreement transparency and the hyper-localization. Thank you. Um, I want to turn to some of the burning questions that's coming up here. Um, there's one question about, uh, you know, with digitalization, it means that more people can actually participate in the geek, what we call the gig economy, like in the case of Gojek, you know, um, the uh, riders. So there is, I guess, uh, we've, and we've heard stories about how um, people who participate in the gig economy, they're not um, uh, because they are not classified as full-time employees, they may be um, denied employment, welfare, and ben benefits, and so on. So, um, so the question is like, how can this be solved? Um, yeah. Um, so th this is one challenge that we have uh, together with the new school, uh, at specifically addressing the issues of the gig economy because. Uh, there are, I mean, there's lots to say about surge pricing, and in fact, when you need it the most, it's most expensive, um, but I, I won't touch that particular point. But the, the issue with uh, many platforms um, that are on the gig economy is they're extractive. So the individuals that bring the value to the platform that are actually delivering the service, whether it's the driving, the labor, are not actually participating in the governance, nor do they share in the profit. So the profit is extracted, the, um, 
they are subject to the whims of or the manipulation of whoever is running the platform. And I'm not suggesting that Gojek does that, but, but that, that's a general pattern. And so the, the alternative is what's called a platform co-op, um, which means that it's governed, owned, and uh, the workers or whoever is providing the value, and, and it, that may also be the users, are um, sharing or are they're governing and they're sharing in the profit. And this is also an approach that we're taking to data. So if you are very unusual, if you are um, very vulnerable to data abuse, like you have a, a, a rare illness, then who do you trust with that particular data? You may be denied insurance. Or um, there are all sorts of things. So what is happening is there are uh, data co-ops that are emerging, including things like me data, or there's many examples. The idea being that you form your own data trust, you govern what uh, data is collected, how it's used, and who has access to it. Any other thoughts? Yes. Um, let me introduce some Korean interesting examples to use uh, technologies to provide this more opportunities, to especially the, uh, in economic activities to a vulnerable class. Uh, for a long time in Korea, the deaf cannot have a driving license because they can hear the connections or what the others traffic, the alarming sound. But recently, it is allowed to the deaf thanks to technologies. So even some text drivers, or text, even some Korean deaf text driver you can meet in the street. Technologies is always find some way to provide that kind of specific situations. So I just want to say that be optimistic, not too pessimistic. We have we, we will find some solution in the end. Well, maybe just very quickly to respond, well, first to the points. Um, so if you think about, say, driver, driver partners, and the original motivation was saying that they don't have access to some of the benefits. And so you abstract out the point that Professor Yuta was making, which is around the nature of the organization versus the benefits that, the nature of the organization, I would say, is can be reasonably decoupled, na the nature of the organization and the nature of employment can be reasonably decoupled from the uh, from the benefits and how well a, a, a worker, whether the worker is self-employed or the worker is employed by the organization is taken care of. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if you're employed in an organization, then you have all the obligations thereof and also some of the benefits. But say the driver partners that are on Gojek, uh, they also have access to uh, insurance, access to medical sick leave. So, I mean, there are some of these things. And some of those come about because they are the right things to do. Some of the some of these things may come about because it has been regulated. Some of, they come about through many different ways. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would submit that uh, just because an organization is a for-profit organization doesn't mean that you can't have the benefits. And just because a worker is, a, is a, someone who offers his services for hire doesn't mean that he will not be able to have a good form of self-governance. And so the choice that is afforded is actually one of the most valuable things that a worker in the gig economy does enjoy. And so what does he do with the rest of his choice, his or her choice? Mm -hmm. Because if you don't do anything useful with the rest of his or her choice, then you probably might not want to be in the gig economy then. Because why are you in the gig economy if not for the choice? Thank you. Uh, we are running short on time, so but I would like to include the audience who may not have access to a phone. So if you have a burning question, uh, please raise your hands and uh, one of our um, colleagues will send a mic to you. Yeah, yes. I've got a loud voice, so uh, okay. I, a question for you, though. Could you talk a little bit more about edge cases and how designing for those can be economically viable? Sure, yes. Um, so the, 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 in a, the, so the, the main point that I'm trying to make is, uh, or the main point that has been made and has been proven 
um, time and time again. Actually, I, I'll refer to something that some of you may have heard of, and that is the electronic curb cut or the digital curb cut. Um, if you think of any innovations that um, you are using, whether it is the, uh, the keyboard on your phone, whether it's um, the, which came from a typewriter, whether it's um, the uh, subtitles that you see up there, whether it's microphones, all of these can be traced back to a time or a point when someone was trying to address the needs of an edge case. Um, where there was uh, resourcefulness was required, there wasn't a current solution, and uh, something new had to be built. And so if you want innovation, then that, that is the direction to go. There is a, a very good um, sort of uh, collection of these particular examples uh, done by Stephen Jacobs called the electronic curb cuts. The reason it's called the curb cuts is it, um, what it comes from uh, sidewalks, are they called sidewalks here, or uh, pavements or whatever there, uh, in order for a wheelchair to go up onto the, the curb, uh, there had to be a ramp built, and of course, people with whe wheelchairs are the, not the ones that use it the most, it's people with uh, baby carriages, uh, luggage carts, etc. So the idea being if you design for the edge then you are making it much easier and more innovative uh, for everyone else as well. And there's many, many examples, but the same applies to data. M most discoveries um, have been made or most of the, the biggest insights have been made because someone looked at the edge or looked at, uh, didn't get rid of the outliers, but noticed the weak signals. It's the uh, harbinger of where the trends are going, etc. But I, I, I know it's time. No. <laughs> time um, is short. Actually, there is a one last question that um, I think many in the audience would like to ask. And I think this is a question that everyone can answer. And that question is really, um, we talked about um, how design needs to be inclusive. Um, but from your respective uh, uh, different uh, sectoral perspectives. What do you think are the key barriers to actually um, transforming design to make it genuinely inclusive, especially when we are talking about emerging tech such as AI and um, machine learning? Because there's actually, um, you know, with the emerging tech, there's so much um, that we don't know about how people actually will be using them. Um, so I think um, how much people know about them is actually, I think, another big question. So maybe one final round of responses and we'll end. So um, from my point of view, it's the, uh, the mindset. It isn't the technology, it isn't the costs, it's um, how the mindset that we are unaware of, um, that we ha then impose upon our machines. Uh, the way that we have moved into artificial intelligence is not the way that we moved into the invention of cars, say, where it was a very revolutionary idea. We're actually taking a very old framework um, and imposing it on these new systems that have much greater affordances. Uh, machine, uh, the machine learning and artificial intelligence is a parallel processor. There's no need to do the reductionism that we've done in our human research before. Let's look at how we can use it to um, help us to navigate complexity and to serve diversity instead. Mm, I agree with mindset is most important things from the beginning, uh, but I don't want to, the, to deny the possibility that just, uh, sometimes, in, at least some, in some circumstances, we have to be a little bit more aggressive to adopt new technologies or to do the system. So, for example, so the market economy is not working in the old, in always in the right direction, as you know. But in most cases, it works. It works. The history said it works. So even I don't I don't disagree with the, uh, her opinion about that. But 
if we want to cover as many people as possible so within these systems, we have to approach in both ways in the same time. We have to include or we have to include the minorities or the vulnerable class from the beginning. From the beginning. But at the same time, we have to focus on to approach uh, to uh, serve as many people as possible. It's, it is the same. It, it, this kind of, it's a very, very difficult task, but anything, anyone cannot be abandoned by, from the policy maker's perspective. That's the my point. I have to just make one, one point, and that is, if we had to choose, um, do we start at the edge or do we start in the middle? It actually costs far less to um, work with individuals that are at the edge because they have the greatest diversity, the largest, they cover the largest spread of the terrain. You need hundreds and thousands of people that are in that center. So if we are worried about cost, if we're worried about time, um, start at the edge rather than the middle. <laughs> okay, um, Mr. Lin? Maybe I'll offer a slightly different interpretation to that, which is um, it's useful, t it's good in principle to say start at the edge, and it's also very good in principle to say let's start with a long-term perspective of what the solution is. But very often, precisely the curb cut example you provided, very often we may not realize we didn't design for PMDs in Singapore, but if we design for wheelchairs in Singapore, such that wheelchairs could get off the curbs, then 20 years later, 30 years later, now that we have PMDs, oh wow, PMDs can actually use it. So what I would offer is that it's true, can design for the edge, but uh, particularly in the technology sort of product world, rapid iteration may make sense. And through the iteration and the interaction of the product with the market, with the consumers, that is where you get the feedback. That will uh, also allow you to surface who are the edge, because we don't necessarily have a view of the dots. It is nice to say, post facto, you can say, these are the dots and this is the scatter and this is the di distribution. Before, a priori, we don't have that, we may not have that information, particularly if it is a new product or a new service that we're trying to roll out. One last response. <laughs> so, um, the, the okay, now, now it's working. Um, the, I, I, I mean, to some extent, well, what, what I would challenge you um, with respect to that, I, yes, we do need to iterate. Um, but one of the things that happens with current iteration, especially within design thinking or most design thinking uh, systems, is that we're iterating towards one winning solution. But in fact, if we think of our, um, the systems that we're innovating or the services or products, then at not as a product or a one widget or gadget, but as a system as a whole, an ecosystem, because most of these are complex adaptive systems, then in what we should be doing is iterating to include more and more, not towards one winning system. We create a much more flexible adaptive uh, tool or environment policy, or, um, so we can, yes, use iteration, but iteration to include more as opposed to the winning solution. No, sorry, just, just a quick one. I mean, one of the things I did want to say was it's definitely not one size fits all, but then if you think of sort of commercial business ecosystems that by nature of trying to be an ecosystem, then you have to be inclusive. But I mean, definitely agree that then it, it is not one size fits all. If you even think of the app that we have, um, different users come on for different reasons and we don't expect that they all use the same service or use that service every day. But the bigger the surface area is of capture, then you can get and serve more people. Yeah. So on that note, um, I'd like to uh, thank our panelists. I think we can, I can safely say that there's no one in the middle in this panel. Everyone is very diverse. And um, because there are more questions uh, than we have time for, please, uh, I encourage uh, all of you who have uh, posted questions, please approach our speakers and engage them talk to them during the break. Um, thank you very much. Please join me in thanking our speakers.